Hello and welcome to the Geeks Review. I'm Royce. And I'm Joshua. Godzilla and Kong, two literal titans of the giant monster movie genre, have come together at last in Godzilla vs. Kong. We're going to be discussing the new film, giant monster movies in general, and later we're going to be talking about Falcon and Winter Soldier, the new Disney Plus series, part of the MCU, the Avengers series, and offer our thoughts and what's happened so far and speculation on what's probably going to happen for the next two episodes. We'll be back, of course, in a few weeks' time to discuss that in more depth. Well, it's a very short series compared to WandaVision, which had about nine episodes. Yeah, whereas this is only the six. Six episodes. Longer episodes, though. Longer episodes. It's a bit more of like a stretched out film. Mm. But yes, we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. First up, Godzilla vs. Kong. This is the fourth entry in the big movie monster, Monsterverse series uh it's a sequel to 2014's godzilla which you've seen i believe uh, i i caught bits of it yes i didn't see all of it uh 2017's kong skull island which yeah. i've seen i've seen all of these yeah and 2019's godzilla king of monsters i have seen a bit of that yes uh the big monster fights i guess the, um actually no i didn't actually get that far all oh, right okay yeah, um no, no reason you go to see these movies no <laughs> no I, i'm not a big monster movie fan but i do know that this is the first western version of godzilla versus kong yeah with um the 1962 godzilla versus kong versus godzilla released in japan by ishiro honda yeah part of the uh, toho brand you know yes. i mean Godzilla originally came out as sort of like a uh, a word of warning or sort of a... Uh, anti-nuclear energy, uh, sort of anti-nuclear war type of deal. Yeah, especially after what happened, you know, in World War Two. Yeah. Um, Hiroshima and... Nagasaki. Yes. But then, of course, Godzilla stomping on things and fighting giant monsters has universal appeal. And now we've gone and got these big CGI American produced versions Mm, so, um, still kind of using the old um, designs from the Toho films. Yeah, modernized a bit. There's that sort of approach they're taking now where they sort of try to make things look a bit more grounded as much as they can. So if you've got, got a giant bird, he's more a pterodactyl now as opposed to a bird. Which, yeah, well, I mean, well, that's just getting into scientific evolution, you know, <laughs> with dinosaurs being more bird-like than reptilian. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole topic but um that, that's not what we're here to discuss <laughs> godzilla versus kong what do you think i'm gonna say what we're all here for we're not here for the humans and mm. the humans are a bit rushed in this they they have agency but you're not there to sympathize with them you're here to see a giant monkey beat a radioactive lizard yeah i mean you do have carryovers from the previous film uh, millie bobby brown best known for enola holmes and stranger things yeah returns from the previous film and I sort of found her a bit insufferable in this one for some reason. Teenagers, am I right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's been talk, actually, that she could potentially be a good casting for a young Princess Leia. That's a topic in itself. Yeah, I mean, obligatory Star Wars reference. Uh, we're doing that <laughs> yeah. all the time lately. Yeah. So, yeah, she's very sort of Princess Leia in this, I would say. You know, very like, oh, well, I know what I'm doing. And Take charge. Moment. You're an idiot. Move out of my way. Um, Julian Dennison from Hunter Yes, Water. I was a bit surprised with that. Yeah. I was like, huh. He... It's the Kiwi boy from Hunter of the Little People. Yeah, and Deadpool. Oh, God, he's been everything. Subway commercials now. Yeah, yeah, he's really getting out there now. Well, okay, spoilers, I guess, for this film. You've gone and got Godzilla, and you've gone and got Kong, known as Kong, not King Kong, mm. uh, in this but you've also got the appearance of Mecha Godzilla, who is a staple of the traditional films. And Julian Dennison's character is the one who actually gets to say the name. Mecha Godzilla. And the other guy, Bernie, the conspiracy nut, which too hard hitting home for conspiracy nuts, um, calls it Robot Godzilla. <laughs> no, that's Mecha Godzilla. Yeah. He said it. It's a quite a short film like it comes out under it, two hours it does an um hour and 50 uh hour and 50 yeah yeah hour and 50 and visually spectacular oh absolutely phenomenal the hollow earth area bloody picturesque very um the land at time forgot yeah the the idea that this film presents well the last one did a bit as well that the earth is hollow and deep within the earth's core there's not you know molten you know magma and all that it's monsters you know yeah the land that time forgotten sort of up is down pretty much and there's like this strange energy source that we want to harness but you know yeah that's getting to heavy spoiler territory this film is still kind of at cinema yes kind of 
By the time of recording, it's probably on its way out to make way for other films. Yeah, that's likely. Um, and really, the fight scenes are... It's a big CGI monster fight, but you know... There's weight. Damn, it looks pretty. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of weight to it. I mean, it's not it's not men in suits like it used to be. I not- do miss that a little bit, but it is <laughs> mo-capping. Yeah, so it's still men in suits in a sense. Yeah, but it's uh, men in suits with a digitally imposed creature over them. Yeah, and that sort of allows there to be a bit of weight to their yeah. movements. And even though it's not a direct, you know, one-to-one translation, it does enable these things to look a lot more real. But then, I mean... I said the lighting, the colouring, there's... Oh, it's pretty as hell. I mean, the first fight in the Tasman Sea, you could see the water rush, running off Godzilla and almost giving him, like, this little white highlight to his scales oh, yeah. with the and lighting because it was about, like, what, sunrise or sunset? It was sunrise, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I just said picturesque, beautiful skies and um, a later fight, which is shown in the trailers, is in Hong Kong. It's just neon-saturated and really just vibrant colors and you've kind of got the two extremes of like beautiful natural light and just this really stark artificial light and I, there's one shot i remember when there were several shots where kong falls back and he's like he's soaked in seawater and he flops back and he's you know he's this giant building sized creature but then you sort of see the water falls slowly because of like the actual you can scale. See, almost see the like the the um the actual individual hairs you know they almost yeah. went through and actually painstakingly did the fur like real cg the fur like real fur and how it reacts to water yeah and then in in the ice in at one point in the film in the ice where it just his fur is all just matted together and yeah like i said godzilla is something else entirely you got, it's got like very well attention to detail it is yeah and it just makes these things feel there's something about them though but there's, there is a thing with CGI, I find, where something still looks real or convincing, but you get a sense it's still not real. The Uncanny Valley. Yeah. Well, it's less of like a uncomfortable... F- I mean, we look at like a really well-done CGI character of Thanos in Avengers films, and he's a big purple man. Yeah, and we've got no I real... still don't believe he's there. Yeah, I, I think it's because we've got no reference for him. For yeah. what that would actually look like. It's... And these guys... Well, yeah, it's a giant lizard and a giant mon- a gorilla. Sorry, yeah. gorilla, gorilla, not, not, not monkey. Yes. T- two different species. Um, Yeah, they do kind of look real, but they do look like that they have been drawn up at a digital artist's little board. Yeah, it's that sort of strange mixture, hey? Yeah, it's... It's not like the suits where, oh, you can easily go fake. <laughs> well, that's as well is talking about the movement of them. I mean, Godzilla, even though I guess there is a human performance behind it, it's still very reptilian. It's still like a crocodile. It's still... Shark-like. Yeah. And uh, I'm not too sure about this film. I don't think it is. But in Kong Skull Island, Kong was played by Toby Kevill, who's a British actor. He's been in um, Guy Ritchie's Rock and Roller. He's been in... Black Mirror, he was actually, he played a human soldier in that film and also did the motion capture for Kong. And he actually did the motion capture in the recent Planet of the Apes movies, opposite Andy Serkis, who's, you know, best known as Gollum, Smeagol, uh, Snoke from Star Wars, and he played King Kong in Peter Jackson's 2005 film. Yes. So, (laughs) accomplished monkey actors. Mm, Yeah. And whoever's behind it now does a really good job as well. Agreed. And it's very human and that you can connect with him and read him. Kong, that is, not Toby Gevel. <laughs> well, I mean, you can read Toby Gevel. Oh, you can read Toby Gevel as much as you want. But, um, yeah, Kong definitely has a bit more of a human element, sort of trying to represent almost us, really. Mm. What did you think about the, um, the sign language? Yeah, I liked that. That was a good touch. I did find out, actually, the girl, because you know, Skull Island, you know, mm. the, the one soul remaining resident of Skull Island is this young girl, and she's actually played by a deaf actress. Ah. Who was actually signing for real, so that's why they incorporated that element. Or presumably looked for an actress who could actually sign. sign, Which adds a much-needed level, I think. And it's sort of presented in a way it's very matter-of-fact. Yeah. And even Godzilla, we did say a bit earlier, even though he's quite monstrous, there's a few times where his eyes are quite human. Mm. And you can actually not read... You know, humanity or sort of emotion from him. 
you can kind of tell that there's more behind that I'm going to eat that mob. And he laughs. He's got an evil yeah, laugh. He has an evil laugh at a scene after kicking Kong to the ground. <laughs> um, but yes, this is really interesting. Really. It is. Uh, it's a good switch off film in my bright opinion. And that's what I'm thinking of most monster films. Mm. I know I'm probably going to get castrized for that. But um, <laughs> I'm really not a big monster fan. No, neither. But... There's one thing this film does is it doesn't weigh in the human cost whatsoever. Oh, I no. mean, Hong Kong is devastated. Like, that ape was thrown through. Um, and even at the beginning with the attack in Florida. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole inciting incident is that Godzilla is considered to be like the great equalizer. Any time a giant monster comes up, he fights it and resets the natural order because that giant monster could upset the ecosystem of the Earth. And when he's attacking things for seemingly no reason we come to learn why he's attacking yes he's attacking the apex cybernetics corporation who are building Godzilla, who is who he i guess consents you know is a thing is a threat well because they're using the um godra parts yeah Ghidorah was this big three-headed dragon hydra creature from the previous film another carryover from the original movies and yeah i think this one is a much better film than that one mm it's a very different film to the first Godzilla, though, like the 2014 one. It is, because this one is just straight up fighting. Yeah. It, it's, it, it knows what we're here to see. Yeah. While the first Godzilla film that, you know, out of this new iteration of the world of monsters, let's just call it that, shall we? World yeah. of Monsters, was almost like a survival film. Yeah, very emotionally charged, that yes. one. Uh, it was directed by Gareth Edwards, who went on to do Rogue One. And this is a film that if you went into it expecting Godzilla or expecting Brian Cranston, who was in this film and just came off Breaking Bad the year before, you were kind of going to be let down. Yes, but they used them quite well and sparingly. Yeah, that's... Yeah, exactly that. It was just... He didn't waste them at no. all. And what teasers you do get of Godzilla is uh, really impactful. Phenomenal. Yeah, you just feel the scale. And he actually feels a bit smaller in this one, I would say, because he mm. was massive. In that first one, he just felt huge in this one because he's so sort of... It's not lost that, but he's still got that massive... Yeah, picture. I guess it's more... It would be... Un, they're, they're trying to give Kong a little bit of an advantage, you know? Yeah. E even out the playing field, you know? Yeah. It, it'd be like trying to throw a feather class fighter up against Mike Tyson. Oh, no. Yeah, true, that. Uh, but, yes, do you have any other big monster movies you wanted to discuss? Um, I... When I was younger, there was one big monster film that stuck out with me, and it was the 90s summer flop, <laughs> Godzilla, with Matthew Broderick. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. Um, <laughs> I loved the crap out of that film as a kid, because I had no understanding of, well, I have no judgment like I do now, <laughs> you know, I'm not as harsh of a critic, and... I, I I just I nearly destroyed that cassette tape. <laughs> it was on video cassette. Um, I remember the toys. I remember the marketing. I remember that little spin-off cartoon that it got. Yes, which was weird. <laughs> um, but this film was hilarious because, well, it's got to look trashing Manhattan. It is, yeah. And you've got the little human characters of Gerano and all that. Hank Azaria, of all people, as a right, cameraman. Yeah. Um, another old Simpsons alumni as a news reporter. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it was great for a kid, you know? Yeah. It was fun. It, was, it definitely amped up the monster mashing, I think. It was done by the same guy who did Independence Day? I believe it was, yes. Yeah. That's the reason why I think he got it is because big disaster movie. I mean, oh, good, he'll be good for the giant monster movie with lots of destruction and all that. Absolutely. It was just a lot of greys, but they did really do well with the scale of Godzilla. A complete redesign. He was like a... Yeah, more, um, very, definitely more reptilian than... A, d a missing link in an evolutionary chain of lizards that we might have seen if the world was a bit different. Yeah. With here, he was more of an irradiated lizard from the nuclear testing out in the Pacific. I do remember, though, it wasn't well received, and within the Toho films, he's just referred to as Zilla, mm. not God, because it's like, you know, he's not that good. Apparently, he's not worthy of the God yeah. title. And he gets, like, 
knocked out like nothing. Like he just gets thrown into the Sydney Opera House or something. <laughs> it definitely is a good film. It was a good film for the time. I'm not sure if it holds up now, particularly with the CG that they used for the, for the Godzilla itself. Yeah. And then they sort of turned around and went, um, yeah, also laying eggs. That was hilarious to watch. The... Um, the Ma- was it Madison Square? It was something. It was yeah, I like think it sort- was, yeah. I've not yeah. seen the film myself, but I sort of know enough about it. Yeah, it had Jay Reno and a bunch of, you know, playing a Frenchman. Yeah. It's some um, French international dude, um, French international agent with a bunch of, I think he may be Belgian, so don't, don't come after me, Jay Reno. <laughs> I love you in some of your films. I'm just, I'm confused about your nationality with your accent <laughs> because I know French is spoken in Belgium. But, um... He, yeah, <laughs> him and his little team with Matthew Broderick trying to take out these little baby Godzillas. Very raptor-like from Very Jurassic raptor-like. It was really the era. It's like, oh, we got CGI. We can do anything with this now. And they really couldn't and shouldn't have. Well, I, a lot of them were still riding the wave of Spielberg and what he was able to replicate with Jurassic Park. Yeah, it's true. And as much as, you know, it was one of those don't do it type of things, it, it, it still kind of sticks with me, you know? Yeah. How they end up at the wrong floor and all these sort of baby raptor zillas sort of turn. <laughs> they know wrong floor, wrong floor, wrong floor, wrong <laughs> floor. Um, another big monster movie I want to talk about is Pacific Rim. Mm. That was directed by Guillermo del Toro, who did... Uh, Hellboy, Pan's Labyrinth, and The Shape of Water. Um, speaking His of love which, letter to anime and robot fights. Yeah, the the, con- the story of this is that, you know, a portal at the bottom of the ocean opened up and giant monsters came through from another dimension and started wrecking stuff, so humanity made giant robots to fight them. Yes. <laughs> Makes sense. And an interesting thing about this film, um, the character's quite good. They, they sort of stick with the... Uh, if, if only like the performances and the sort of the actors. If yeah, the name. Uh, I, I mean, I, I I remember the robots more than I remember the actors. I know <laughs> Idris Elba's in it. That's about it. Yeah. Well, an interesting thing about the robots is that they need to have two pilots yeah, to operate. That's right. And you need to be the, the, the two pilots need to be drift compatible. That's the term they use. You need to be compatible with someone on an emotional level. Ah, sort of like how they did it in Neon Genesis. You had to be compatible with the Ava to use it. If so, I have no knowledge of that. (laughs) But if that's the case... Don't watch it, it's depressing. Oh, okay. It is depressing as hell. Um, But yeah... confusing. Yeah, to be drift compatible, you just need to have this emotional connection. So you could be, you know, lovers, you could be brother and sister, you could be parents, you could be, you know, best friends, as is the case here. So... A really interesting bit of characterization, I thought, was is um with the character of Mako Mori. Yep. And um she she sees the main character of Rawley, and at the beginning of the film, you see he was engaged in a fight with one of the giant kaiju monsters with his brother, and his brother gets killed in action, and Rawley is like struggling to control this giant machine by himself, and when he collapses, he he gets out and he's just covered in all these wounds down the side where his brother was, you know, to sort of symbolize that this machine took a giant chunk out of his soul. Yeah. Yeah. And then later on, you know, it's been a few years later and he meets Mako and he takes off his, his shirt and she sort of stops and stares at him. And you think she's just like checking him out because, you know, he's got muscles and all that, but she sees his scars. And later on, we have a bit of a flashback where we see her childhood, where she was a kid when a kaiju attacked her city and giant, you know, Mecca comes along and, punches it to death, and it turns out it's piloted by um, Idris Elba's character, who sort of becomes her surrogate, you know, adoptive father. And when he climbs out, you actually see that his own co-pilot has died, and he's covered in similar scars. So it allows for that sort of... You understand then, when she looks at him, looked at Rawley, she saw those scars, and, you know, it's a nice bit of connection. And it's a nice ending as well. Uh, spoilers for an eight-year-old film. Now. Yeah. <laughs> but... They don't kiss, they don't fall in love, they're just friends, and that was just... They sort of collapse into each other, you know, out of relief. The one takeaway is the design of the monsters with the kaiju, Hmm. the performances from the actors, and the design of the um, Jaegers, as they're called. That's the word, yeah. Also, um, the voice actress who plays GLaDOS from the Portal, she plays the... Portal games, yeah. Yeah, she plays the robot in this. She plays the AI... Which was a nice little touch I found. And it actually sort of what got me onto this film back when it did come out, even though it 
took a few years for me to go see it. The sequel wasn't directed by Del Toro. No. starred John Boyega as Idris Elba's character's son. Yeah. And it sort of took a more stylized, you know, approach. Almost you, a next generation type of thing from what I saw. I never actually saw it myself. It's um, It's been said before, but one thing that Del Toro's, you know, succeeded at was to present it as if, you know, these are giant weighted things and the camera is constrained by what the cameraman would be physically able to do. So it's as if the cameraman is like set up on a hill or a building or he's down on the ground watching these things. He's not like up close and personal with the blade unless... It just so happens, you know, like a blade shoots out or like a fist flies past. It was very, you know, sort of context, you know, situational yeah. dependent. Whereas the other film, just like the camera zooming and whizzing around, doing things that cameras could not possibly Jump cutting and do. all that, yeah. Yeah, or just more sort of like extreme movements. Yes. I mean, maybe you had a drone, but it's yeah. it was that, that level of which really grounded it. And that's what really yeah. made it for me. But anyway... Giant monster movies. That's it. That's all I got for you. How about Falcon and Winter Soldier? Uh, that's something I can talk more about. So uh, just to sort of wrap up, we've only got about five minutes here. Yeah. Uh, left on this episode. Um, so Falcon and Winter Soldier is a sequel series to, you know, the Avengers, you know. Mainly like stuff like Civil War and um, Endgame. Yeah. you got to got Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes. He was a World War II soldier who... I was experimented on by sort of... He got he went missing in action, was found by Hydra, experimented on, brainwashed, and given a robotic arm. Yeah, turned, and into, turned this... into this super assassin that was used as a um, Hydra's agent of change to steer history in the way that they want them to. And he's now broken his programming and he's, you know, back to his relatively normal self, but he's a man out of time, much like Captain America was. He was Captain America's best friend. Yes. And Sam Wilson, played by Anthony Mackie, is a modern day soldier who uses an advanced piece of, you know, sort of wingsuit technology, like a jetpack with wings that allows his, um, him power rescue. Yeah, allows him to just fly and I mean Bucky's a super soldier, Sam is a regular soldier in this amazing bit of tech and you know, he's sort of above and beyond what a lot of people could do. So, this is a world following Endgame. I mean, people disappeared for five years. And people are coming back after five years. After, you know, Thanos clicked his fingers and wiped them out. And, you know, certain figures who were there before aren't there anymore. And this is sort of seeing, you know, the introduction of a new Captain America played by Wyatt Russell. Yes. Who's the son of Goldie Horn and Kurt Russell, but he's an accomplished actor in his own right. And his character is... A man who less embodies the ideals of the original Captain America and more what America actually is. Yes, so if Steve is what the golden age of America was back in the 40s and World War Two, you know, truth, justice, standing up to bullies and all that, this is definitely get out of my way, America coming through. Yeah, it's really Team America vibes. He's yeah. just forcing himself into these into these situations and i mean the villains we say with with air quotes yeah the the flag smashers yeah these are people who want to return the world to the state it was in during the blip which mm. is the, the moment where people disappeared uh no borders no countries just people helping each other a, a united world yes and it's led by well the lead flag smasher carly morgenthau Yes, played a gender-bent by, version of the original Flag Smasher from the comics. Yeah, played by Erin Kellyman, who's uh, an English actress. She's been in Solo, A Star Wars Story. She was in the Les Mis BBC series a few years yes. ago. And she's currently in a series called Life, which is on Foxtel, if you're checking that out, with Alison Stedman. Uh, she plays a girl with anger issues, and she just seems to be a girl with anger issues in this Oh, well. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's um, got her hands on some super soldier serum, and she's, you know, kicking and punching her way across Europe and trying to... Which adds in another element of of intrigue to the story of where the new Super Soldier Serum has come out. Because it's really, if Spider-Man has become dealing with Tony Stark's sloppy seconds, <laughs> this is dealing with the legacy of Steve. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Because a lot of this is the new Captain America not being reflected of the old days, of the golden days, I should say the recreation and perfection of the super soldier serum which was pretty much the focal point of a lot of the arms races and the experimentation and willingness that they were able to go mm. particularly showing with um Isaiah 
uh, Isaiah, I should say. I can't remember his Isaiah last Bradley. Name. Yeah, yes, he was... Isaiah Bradley, a Korean War veteran who was experimented on by the U.S. with a bunch of other black soldiers. He was one of the few survivors and sent to go and kick Hydra's crap in. It was really quite powerful, that moment, it and it was, was followed by... haunting. What did you think about the scene following where Stan, where Bucky and Sam get into a bit of an altercation and the police show up? I think it was definitely showing sort of... Definitely is still reflective of where America still is now. Like, they're getting yeah. better, but they're still, you know... While you said earlier in the show it is sort of like an extended movie, it's allowed more ch- time to sort of expand upon things. Sam, you're introduced to his his family. He's got a sister. He's got, you know, nephews and that. And to sort of see that he can't even go for a loan, that they weren't compensated or paid for their Avengers, you know. Yeah. Deeds. Sort of because he's black. The implication, because he's a black man, that he's sort of struggling to even get a bank loan, even though he's a big celebrity. It's kind of like... Well, Patel is willing to ask him for a selfie, but not, you know, oh, help out his sister. Yeah. Oh, man, that was... <laughs> um, wrapping He's up. really dealing with the... Yeah. Sorry. This, this could be a discussion for later on. Yeah, once we're we'll definitely explore this but, in a bit. Um, um, it's apparently, gonna be... there's going to be a big cameo. We'll quickly do our thoughts on the next episode on what could yeah. happen. I'm personally thinking we may find out who the power broker is. Yeah, who's this sort of villain who's got control of considerable you know considerable things i honestly think it may be thunderbolt ross that would be interesting played by william hurt yeah because he was working on perfecting the super soldier serum before the blip and then he got blipped and they are thinking of doing a she they are doing a she hulk they series. are doing a she hulk series well okay that's something we can talk about in a few weeks time when we go into this series in more depth it's on disney plus new episode will be airing tomorrow, uh, tomorrow friday evening here in Tasmania, in yep. Australia. Um, I'm Royce. And I'm Joshua. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now.